Hi, everyone. For those of you who do, don't know me, my name is Andrea Lanham, and I am the Parkinson's Program Coordinator here for the NNI Resource Center, and we're excited to have our third Talk with the Dogs presentation today. Um, we'll be hearing from Dr. Phillips, Dr. Rao, and a special patient um, interview today with um, patient Holly Cooper. So at this time, we are going to get the presentation started. At the end, there will be a time for Q&A uh, questions for all the presenters. Um, and you can type that in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. All right, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, thanks, Andrea, for the introduction. So I'm Dr. Abigail Rao, and uh, today Dr. Phillips and I are going to uh, speak about Parkinson's disease and deep brain stimulation. Um, we'll do that for the first half hour of the program, and then for the second half hour, our DBS nurse navigator, Angie Condon, um, will uh, interview um, Holly Cooper, who's one of our patients with Parkinson's disease, who's had DBS herself. Um, so this is the third in uh, what is going to be a quarterly series. Um, our next session will be in July. It will be about essential tremor. Um, and our intention is that these are meant to be um, kind of casual but informative um, sessions. We hope that it feels approachable. So we encourage you to um, type any questions you have into the chat box. You can type them at any time and Andrea will keep track of them and we will answer them all at the end. Um, and we will also be recording this and posting it on the um, Norton Neuroscience Resource Center website for future reference. Uh, so a few acknowledgements. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge our mentors um, and also our partners um, who've taught us a lot of what we know, um, the Norton Neuroscience Resource Center for helping to uh, support our patients and also the logistics for sessions like this, um, and then most importantly, our patients who are our best educators. Um, so here's the website to the Norton Neuroscience uh, Resource Center um, page. So the Resource Center is both a physical place and sort of a virtual space where we've organized a large number of educational resources, um, support resources, classes, groups, um, a wide variety of things. Um, we have uh, the Resource Center both at the Brownsboro and St. Matthew's campus. And we can share this website with you later, but if you just Google um, Norton Neuroscience Resource Center, you should find it pretty easily as well. I have no disclosures for this talk. Um, so for an outline today, uh, we will start um, by hearing from Dr. Phillips about medical treatments of Parkinson's disease. I'll then uh, speak with you about surgical treatments, specifically DBS for Parkinson's disease. Um, and then we'll have a Q&A at the end uh, with Angie, our nurse navigator, and our patient, Holly Cooper. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Phillips now. Thanks, Dr. Rao. So I'll start with talking a little bit about Parkinson's disease and medical treatment of Parkinson's disease. Um, the talk's mostly focused on surgical treatment of DBS, so we'll go through this pretty quickly. It's a broad topic. Um, but first, we'll talk about the definition of Parkinson's disease, and this is from the, the NIH, and it belongs to a group of conditions called motor system disorders uh, resulting from the loss of dopamine-producing uh, brain cells, resulting in, in Parkinsonism. Uh, for the motor symptoms that we see in Parkinson's disease. It's the second most common neurodegenerative disorder uh, behind Alzheimer's disease. It affects one to 2% of the population over the age of 65. Um, men more commonly than women, depending on which study you're looking at, um, as much as two to one. An average age of onset is about 60 years old. Uh, we define young onset Parkinson's disease for someone diagnosed under the age of 50 and juvenile onset, which is quite rare, under the age of 18. So Parkinson's disease symptoms um, can be both motor and non-motor, but the disease diagnosis is based on the presence of the motor symptoms, primarily four cardinal symptoms, uh, including a type of stiffness, of muscle stiffness called rigidity. Slowness of movement is really the hallmark feature. This is called bradykinesia, which means slow movement. Um, also tremor, which is typically a tremor when the hand's at rest. Um, this typically is an asymmetric onset, meaning one side is typically affected before the other side. 
Uh, the other cardinal feature, the fourth, is something called postural instability. You'll see that in the little blue box there on that side. Um, and this is typically not present early, whereas tremor, rigidity, and bradykinesia are often present early on in the disease. Later motor complications can be what are called levodopa-induced dyskinesia, which are extra movements. So these are kind of involuntary, uncontrolled, kind of dancing or writhing movements, which can be a complication of advanced disease. Um, and, and medication complication related to levodopa. Uh, we can also see dystonias in Parkinson's, particularly in the younger onset uh, population. And these are usually um, what are called an off phenomenon. So when the slowness, stiffness, and tremor have returned, if the medicines have worn off, um, often overnight, we'll see these muscle spasms or cramps, often in the toes curling or the, the feet turning under. Uh, and there can also be gait dysfunction, shuffling gait, which is a manifestation of bradykinesia, uh, or even freezing of gait, which is where the feet kind of get stuck, almost they can't move to the, uh, on the floor. Um, and then these balance difficulties like the postural instability. There are also a number of non-motor symptoms that are associated with Parkinson's disease. Uh, neuropsychiatric symptoms like depression and anxiety and memory problems, um, autonomic nervous system problems, including things like constipation, and urinary incontinence, and blood pressure dysregulation. Um, loss of sense of smell is often present early as, as a, a sleep disorders, including one called REM behavior disorder, which is often quite specific for uh, later development of Parkinson's. Um, and then there are also motor features that we mentioned that are not levodopa responsive. So we mentioned back on the initial slide, things like tremor and slowness and stiffness, the bradykinesia and rigidity. These are things that tend to respond to medications, whereas things like freezing of gait often don't, and generally postural instability, which is that imbalance. These are all things listed here, both non-motor for the most part, and, and some of these motor symptoms that do not respond to dopaminergic medicines, levodopa primarily. And so our goals of treatment when we are um, treating someone with a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease with medications are to improve daily functioning, uh, in particular, improve that motor functioning, improve quality of life secondary to that. Uh, we, we do have a goal of, of cure or disease modification. We just don't currently have any medical treatments or surgical treatments for that matter uh, that have been shown to be disease modifying. And so uh, the threshold for intervention be it either adding medications or doing surgery is, is individual based on the patient. So there are non-pharmacologic treatments um, and non-surgical treatments. And these are things, probably the most important thing that patients should realize is exercise is incredibly important for Parkinson's disease and is the only thing so far shown to slow down progression of the disease. So even if a patient chooses not to take medications or have surgery, it is very important that they exercise um, nutrition can play an important role, particularly with some of those non-motor features, including blood pressure and bowel function, so fiber and hydration, and really just education and support, which is what we um, are very proud of to, to have with, with series like these with the Neuroscience Center. Um, the pharmacologic treatment is symptomatic, so when the symptoms of Parkinson's start to impair someone's function and cause them trouble, that's when we try to start a medication. And which medication we choose will depend on severity of symptoms, patient's age, patient's desires, their ability to uh, afford the medication, other medical comorbidities, those all go um, into consideration when you're deciding when and what to start medication lines. So levodopa is really the most effective and, and really the gold standard. There, there was some really myth years ago, probably a generation of neurologists before me, that it was perhaps would cause the disease to progress faster and that one should try to sparingly use this medicine early on or avoid starting the medication. And really these myths have all been debunked with ongoing research. It is by far the most effective medication for treatment of the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. It does not slow down progression of the disease, nor does it speed it up. It simply treats those symptoms in accordance to staging of the disease. This is most commonly found in a generic tablet called carbidopa slash levodopa, which are the two ingredients in what was previously the name brand Cinemet. comes in a control release uh, formulation tablet that's available generically, as well as some other newer formulations of kind of mixed long and short acting uh, in a name brand called Ritari. 
as well as in some combination tablets with some other uh, medications that block enzymes to help it to last longer, and a tablet called Stilevo, which contains in tacopone, uh, and then in an intestinal infusion through a surgically implanted tube into the small intestine, the trade name of Duopa, all really supplying levodopa in one manner or the other um, to the patient. Additional medication classes include anticholinergics, and trihexyphenidyl is listed here. Benztropine is another example of that. These are rarely used in Parkinson's anymore because of the significant side effect pro profile compared to its efficacy. It's pretty effective for tremor sometimes when the other medicines um, are not helpful, but a number of side effects, including blurred vision, dry eyes, dry mouth, urinary retention, constipation, sleepiness, confusion, hallucinations, et cetera, um, prohibit us from using it in the majority of our patients. Amantadine can have some similar side effects to that, but is typically tolerated better, used most commonly for treatment of levodopa-induced dyskinesias, but can also help a little with Parkinson's tremor that may not respond to dopaminergic medicines, um, and has been shown in some cases or formulations to help a little with wearing off or motor fluctuations. Uh, the COMT inhibitors, there's two listed here. There's a couple of new ones on the market. Um, and tacopone is the one most commonly used. It's available generically taken with each dose of levodopa. It can help to extend the life of that dose as someone has further advanced disease and has wearing off of the dose. We can see an extra hour of on time with that. The same is probably true for the monoamine oxidase inhibitors that we see over on the other side, MAOB inhibitors. Um, there's, a couple, there's another additional one available that's not listed here, but these are the two that are available generically, selegiline and resagiline. They block a different en enzyme. Uh, and then we have other dopaminergic medicines called dopamine agonists, and these work on uh, dopamine receptors. Their potency is much less than levodopa. They're often effective um, adequately sometimes for the first couple of years in people that are trying to do a levodopa sparing type of therapy, but they do come with their own set of risks, including things like impulse control disorders, excessive daytime sleepiness, uh, and hallucinations, and so often they're avoided in patients over the age of 65, which really makes up probably the bulk of our clinic. So complications of levodopa therapy are really what will lead us towards uh, further discussion uh, in regards to surgical treatment. So levodopa is very effective for treating those uh, motor symptoms, but over time, patients develop motor fluctuations and dyskinesia. These are really um, manifestations of disease progression in the setting of levodopa use. So it's not that you, levodopa causes the disease to get worse, but as the disease gets worse, the medicines start to not last as long. You don't really have the cellular machinery in the brain to kind of take up and, and parcel out this levodopa that you're taking. In the, in the bloodstream, it has a very short half-life. So early on in the disease of Parkinson's disease, our brain still has some of the machinery to kind of buffer that. This wears off as the disease progresses. And so we see wearing off of the medication before the next dose. And this is what we call off time is when they have return of those initial Parkinson's symptoms, slowness, stiffness, and tremor, which at this point are generally um, progressed as well. So these off periods are often initially predictable, but over time can become less predictable as the doses of the medication are required more frequently. You can have things like dietary interference with uh, dietary protein and that sort of thing that could prevent somebody from having kind of a smooth transition from one dose to the other. In addition, because there's no buffer there, we then kind of have these peaks and valleys in how the, the levodopa uh, level is represented in the brain. And so these extra movements, choreiform or, or dance-like movements that we see in patients at the peak of dose, these are called levodopa-induced dyskinesias. And so these can occur kind of as, a, as we have ebb and flow in these fluctuations in motor function. And these can also be quite disruptive to patients as well. Risk factors for this include a younger age of onset, um, presence of the previously mentioned motor fluctuations, and then higher doses of levodopa in general correlate, although they can occur in some patients at very low doses. So 50 to 75% of patients develop the, these motor complications within the first six years and up to 80% in uh, eight to 10 years after the diagnosis. And again, particularly more common with younger onset patients. And so we see with progression early on, um, 
six to eight hours in between the doses of the medication. You see the dark gray kind of triangle part there. That's our, what we would call our therapeutic window. And so there's enough cellular machinery there to kind of buffer that. So we don't cross that threshold at the top into dyskinesia nor down into the off state. So this early in the disease, often referred to as the honeymoon period. That dyskinesia threshold decreases as the disease progresses and the efficacy threshold decreases as well. So that width of that area starts to decline as we go. And so you see that this duration of response as you have moderate and then more advanced disease between off symptoms, good on symptoms, and then on symptoms with dyskinesia starts to shorten. So you have to take the medication more frequently and then you're potentially having peak dose at the peak of that little uh, dotted line there, side effects. And in more advanced disease, you can see that that may be as short as a couple of hours and, and only maybe uh, a quarter or a half of that in the kind of sweet spot of the dark gray there. So the goals for DBS generally, when we're talking about Parkinson's disease, is really kind of two categories. These motor fluctuations are really the mainstay. So when someone has advanced enough disease where they're really kind of chasing that sweet spot, they're overshooting and having peak dose side effects of the medicine, or they don't tolerate other side effects of the medication um, to get an adequate on response um, because of maybe nausea or, or drops in blood pressure, um, and then they're having wearing off and they're having to take the dose very frequently. This is when somebody is probably the best candidate for DBS. The other exception uh, is someone who maybe has refractory tremor even early on related to Parkinson's. But the mainstay would be for those people who are trying to achieve the best on state without troublesome uh, motor fluctuations and dyskinesias. And once we've reached this point medically where we've optimized that medical care, that's when we move on to a discussion of potential DBS. All right, thank you, Dr. Phillips. Um, so now I'll provide a few minutes um, about an overview of DBS, the surgery, what it is, and um, what our goals are. So uh, to summarize, deep brain stimulation is a reversible and modulatable implanted device. Uh, the device provides a source of electric current. It's implanted into the brain, and it's programmed uh, by someone like uh, Dr. Phillips, or a neurologist, to treat specific disease symptoms. Uh, so DBS was initially developed um, in the late 1990s uh, for the um, treatment of essential tremor. Um, and actually, that's, you know, that's slightly inaccurate. It was actually approved before 1990, but I guess we could say it became uh, widespread after FDA approval in the 90s. Um, certainly, it had been around in the research world for a very long time. Uh, research in DBS actually started for treatment of chronic pain back in the 60s and 70s. Um, this number of how many patients worldwide have had DBS is um, probably quite outdated because I first saw this number many years ago of about 175,000 patients worldwide. So I'm sure by now it's um, something like well over 200,000. Um, so I mentioned that uh, the first FDA approval in the United States for DBS was for treatment of essential tremor. Um, the therapy was approved in 2002 for treatment of Parkinson's disease, and then in 2003 for treatment of dystonia. It also has some um, special uh, research treatment for obsessive compulsive disorder that is FDA approved, um, not commonly used, um, but uh, most recently, in 2018, it was approved for the use of medical refractory epilepsy, and so that's becoming a more and more common indication as well. Um, you may wonder how the same implanted device or surgery is used for all these very different diseases. Um, the truth is that actually it is a very different surgery for each disease. The hardware is the same, but the part of the brain that we're targeting, meaning where we're putting these small wires, um, differs. And so really what the implanted device is, is a few different components. Um, this schematic kind of shows them, but actually this is a more accurate schematic. So there's a small brain wire. This is 1.27 millimeters in diameter. This passes um, uh, through the surface of the brain down to this small target uh, deep in the center of the brain. So that's why it's called deep brain stimulation. And so what this target is varies by the disease we're trying to treat. 
So the wire then is held in place with a little plastic cap onto the skull. It's connected to an extension wire under the scalp, which runs down to a pacemaker device um, that lives under the skin below the collarbone. Um, so, you know, I mentioned that the therapy was first approved um, in 1997, but over the past few years, especially, I would say, um, you know, past five to eight years, there's been really a massive explosion in the technology. Um, so now we're having new technologic advances released almost every six to 12 months. Um, there are three major companies that manufacture um, the hardware that's used for the surgery. So meaning the actual uh, wires and the um, battery or the pacemaker-like device. And so every few years now that there's some competition, we're getting new advances. So the hardware is getting more robust. It's getting smaller. Um, it's having really clean, intuitive interfaces for faster programming. They all have a patient programmer that allows the patient to make some adjustments under the clinician's guidance, perhaps. Um, they have technology where we can direct the stimulation one way or the other, where we can shape the field of stimulation. Um, and there is some technology where we can actually do the programming remotely without the patient even necessarily coming in, but by a telemedicine visit. So um, everything I mentioned is, is really what's listed here. So we have um, really technology that is tried and true in many ways, but still improving. So it's very robust. Um, it's something that tends to last the patient their lifetime. They don't necessarily need repeat surgery because it breaks or it fails. That is a very rare event. Um, we have lots of different ways for the neurologist to program to really get the optimal symptom uh, control and the least amount of side effects. Um, and we also now have ways where we can use some of this technology to sense uh, certain brain waves. So that same wire that delivers the stimulation can now also um, detect certain brain waves, store them in the battery, and your neurologist can download that data and look to get a sense of um, what the stimulation is doing. Um, the thought is that in the next couple of years, this will probably lead towards a closed loop system where the battery uh, can be programmed to actually detect a certain signal and then change the stimulation based on that signal. Um, so although we have, you know, these three different um, systems, they uh, generally really all kind of do the same thing. Um, the concept's the same. They all deliver controlled electric impulses at controllable strengths, pulse widths, frequencies. These are gentle electric impulses. They're not something where the patient feels shocked or anything like that. Um, but, you know, there's some pros and cons. And so really your team kind of selects what seems to be the best option for you, um, assuming we get to DBS surgery. Um, and so we talked a little bit about who surgery is for or who it helps the most in Parkinson's disease. I'll tell you now about the actual surgical process briefly. Um, so this process is, is specific to Norton. Each center may do it a little bit differently, but um, much of this is similar no matter where you are. So at Norton, we do the surgery under general anesthesia. It is actually a two-stage surgery, so technically two different surgeries. Um, I apologize, I shouldn't say surgical technique of your choice. That's um, that's a typo that's from a slide intended for a version of this talk that's actually for surgical trainees. <laughs> so trainees, um, when they're starting their practice, uh, um, get to use their choice. But, <laughs> but yeah, um, you as the patient do not need to choose your surgical technique. Uh, so I apologize for that. So um, surgery is done under general anesthesia. Um, after the patient is asleep, um, we perform the surgery. In stage one, we place um, two brain wires, typically one on each side of the brain, um, because those small targets are bilaterally distributed. So you have a left one and a right one. Um, the surgery takes a couple hours and the patient then is woken up. They're in the recovery room. They spend one night in the hospital and they're home the next day. Stage two happens one or two weeks later. Uh, it's also under general anesthesia. It takes about uh, 45 minutes or so, less than an hour. And this is where we connect these um, brain wires to the extension wires and we place the battery um, under the skin. So the patient is discharged home that same day. 
And about two weeks later is when the patient has their initial programming session with their neurologist. Um, so this is when the stimulator will be turned on for the first time. And your neurologist likely will be testing your movements, your stiffness, your slowness, your tremor, your walking. Uh, they will also be testing for any stimulation-related side effects, which may be things like some contractures or pulling um, of certain parts of the body. Uh, so they'll they'll walk through and test and figure out, you know, where the optimal place is to uh, send the stimulation from and really how to design all the parameters optimally. And then they'll have the patient um, see how things go at home over the next few weeks. The patient may return weeks or months later or may follow up by phone. And so it's a bit of an iterative process to um, get the programming optimal. And over time, as the patient's disease cha state changes and evolves, certainly the programming can be changed as well. Um, in terms of the batteries, there are um, primary cell batteries, there are rechargeable batteries. Um, each has pros and cons, and that's also something that um, we as your team of physicians will make a, a team recommendation, what's best for you personally. Um, the rechargeable batteries can last 10 to 15 years, um, but require some frequent recharging. The non-rechargeable batteries don't require any recharging on a daily or weekly basis. They typically last about three to five years. Um, so battery replacement is a minor surgery. It's not a repeat of the brain surgery, but it's um, rather opening the incision just to get under the skin at the chest wall. It takes about 20 minutes and the patient goes home the same day. Um, so DBS surgery overall is very safe. Um, as with any surgery, it certainly has risks. And so really it's about balancing the risks and the benefits. And we would only ever recommend surgery if we thought it was a very clear balance of much more benefit than risk. Um, risks of any surgery include things like uh, bleeding. Bleeding in the brain, of course, can be very bad, um, can be devastating. Luckily, the rates of devastating hemorrhage are in the one to 2% in the literature. Um, also in the literature, infection rates are quite low, um, about 3%. Um, Hardware-related issues such as um, the wire breaking or malfunctioning, incredibly low, really less than 1%. And then I mentioned that there can be some stimulation-related side effects. These aren't really, I would say, necessarily risks of surgery, but really they're expected consequences of stimulation spreads to part of the brain close by. Um, where we don't necessarily want it to spread to. So you can see that, you know, where the tip of the wire is, is in a very small ana anatomic area. Uh, all these other little circles are other anatomic areas. And so, you know, if we crank up any sort of battery or circuit enough, sure, stimulation will spread, but we don't do that for safety. We, um, you know, that's where uh, your neurosurgeon's training and getting the wire in the right spot and your neurologist training and Programming the lead properly um, really helps to minimize those stimulation-related side effects and optimize um, your outcome. So um, who is DBS for? You know, Dr. Phillips mentioned um, really what some of the goals um, of DBS are in terms of motor treatment. Um, really, you know, candidates for surgery, obviously, if we're going to recommend um, DBS for Parkinson's disease, we want to make sure you have Parkinson's disease. Um, so typically, you know, it takes kind of a few years into the onset of symptoms for it to really become clear that a patient does have Parkinson's disease. And then also for them to really reach a point where um, non-medical treatment or medical treatment has, has proven to be inadequate. So it's really when these motor fluctuations or dyskinesias or tremor become um, problematic that we start to think about surgery. Um, we want to make sure that the patient has had, at some point at least, a good, even if it's temporary or short-lived response to levodopa, that's part of um, really confirming the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease as well. Um, more importantly, we want to make sure that motor symptoms are really a main cause of disability as opposed to something like um, cognitive symptoms. So, for instance, if a patient had um, was really suffering from um, terrible cognitive disorder, um, and we improved their movements, but they still suffered from the cognitive aspect, we may have not really helped their overall quality of life with surgery. 
Um, DBS is not meant to help some symptoms and in fact may worsen them. It's not to say they will worsen, but it's just to say that we certainly think about where these symptoms are in our individual patient. Um, we get objective assessment of where they're at and we balance um, any presence or absence of these symptoms in the risk benefit analysis of surgery. So some of those things are cognitive or psychiatric impairment, um, swallowing issue, or significant balance issue or falls. Um, overall, realistic expectation of DBS for Parkinson's disease is that uh, there will be increased on time, meaning um, increased time that the patient was at their optimal state with medications, um, but in fact, possibly less medications. Um, even if the medications were the same, it would be expected that the on time would be increased and the off time would be decreased. Um, currently, it is not universally thought that DBS alters the progression of Parkinson's, um, though there is some newer research that is um, perhaps showing that it may. Um, the widespread thought is it does not necessarily eliminate the need for medications, though we um, are able to do that for some patients. It certainly may reduce the dose of medications in most patients. Um, and as I mentioned, it can exacerbate some symptoms, so we definitely at least want to know where that's at with our patients and discuss really the, the overall risk benefit analysis. Um, as you can see, you know, the process of deep brain stimulation surgery is a little bit of a process. It's a couple surgeries. It's um, a number of evaluations with our multidisciplinary team. It's some advanced imaging. Um, so it's really helpful to patients to have a good support system in place um, to take them through this. Um, we have found that uh, patients really benefit from having a multidisciplinary team approach. And so we've designed our program here at Norton to, um, uh, to mimic that. So we have um, specialists of many different fields, neurologists, neurosurgeons, rehab therapists, neuropsychologists, um, even specialized uh, neuroradiologists um, who really all work together. Many of us will individually assess patients, and then we have a monthly team conference where we um, where we talk about each of our patients. Not all centers do this. I think there are centers that have close communication, but really we, we enjoy talking together about um, all of our patients every month. And then really central to our um, clinical care and support for patients is our DBS nurse navigator, Angie Condon, we are very lucky to have someone like her. Um, and so, you know, DBS can really be a transformative um, therapy for many patients. Um, I mentioned that it's not necessarily a cure or a tool to slow disease progression. Um, just like any surgery, it's not necessarily for everybody. Um, it is a bit of a process, but if it's really something that um, you're interested in and we work you up and we talk as a team and we feel like it's right for you, you know, it, it really can be beneficial um, for the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. It has a few different types of risks that I discussed. Um, some are sort of surgical risks that apply to any surgery and some are really um, specific to DBS. So um, I've tried to keep this really brief so that we have um, some time for Angie and Holly to speak. Um, there are some resources uh, here that um, I'll leave this slide up, um, and we can also send all, uh, this entire slide deck to anyone interested. Um, just type it into the chat box. Um, uh, but these are some good uh, resources for learning more. Um, so I want to thank you. I'm now going to um, go on mute and turn it over to Angie and Holly, but I will leave this slide up. Sorry, I think I was on mute. Um, thank you, Dr. Rao and Dr. Uh, Phillips for the overview of Parkinson's and DBS. Um, I'm Angie, I'm the nurse navigator um, for DBS here at Norton's. Um, and it's a great pleasure and honor to be here and to be interviewing one of our uh, DBS patients, Holly. Um, she, um, is one of our Parkinson patients and received DBS in 2021 here at Norton's. Um, before we start our interview, I just need to, to say that not all patients um, will experience the same results. You know, everybody has their 
individualized, um, you know, journey, journey. So we're here with Holly and she's here to share her um, experience and journey. And so I thank you, Holly, for being here and willing to talk to us and, and share your journey with us. So, thank you. yeah, so let's start, let's kind of start at the beginning um, with your journey with Parkinson's prior to DBS. Um, when were you diagnosed and, you know, what was your first symptoms and, you know, kind of, you know, let us know, you know, how, how, what your experience was. Mm -hmm. First of all, I have to thank all of you, the team at Norton, or I would not be here. <laughs> mm. Oh, it's really been something. So I, um, at 50, I experienced breast cancer at 55. I thought it was the breast cancer treatments, the um, medical that they gave me that was making me have the zombie walk. And, but then a little arresting thumb trim, tremor began. It was 2015. I ended my cancer treatments in 2014. And then 2015 was officially diagnosed with Parkinson's. And that was devastating. Um, but I was going to exercise. Um, I went to Crestman, did all of that. And those Therapists really help you see what to look out for, what to do. And I really wasn't feeling too bad. The resting thumb tremor wasn't a big deal, but I had noticed things that every bit of my movements, I was slowing, slowing. So I guess bradykinesia is the worst um, at that point. Mm -hmm. And I think Dr. Phillips, when I saw him in December of 2016 then. Um, he said, there is DBS, but too soon. Let's try some things. So I tried selegiline for five, six months, nothing. Amantadine, five to six months, nothing. Exercise, exercise. And finally, the stiffness was getting to be too much. So it was July 2017. I said, okay, we started with cinnamon, 25 100s of the uh, cinnamon carbidopa levodopa, and it offered me relief. And it was great. If I could just keep the nausea at bay with a little snack when I would have my medication, and it started out three times a day. Um, two years later, five times a day, then six times a day, it was just progressing despite as hard as I was exercising. Um, it happened. So yeah. then, then I began to experience the on and off chasing that good period of uh, movement, freedom, something. And pretty soon what led me to DBS was I realized I was, I was saying no to social engagements. Anything I would go do, the best I could do was pull it together for an hour and a half to go to the gym to do boxing and, you know, go through the motions of that. But the rest, I was wiped out. Mm -hmm. That's it. There's got to be something better. I had been to wonderful expos that Norton had hosted for years before I got to this point. I had seen Dr. Rao's wonderful presentation of uh, the patient with the halo. It was so cringy, I couldn't watch it, but I knew it was there all along. And Dr. Phillips kept reminding me it is a tool in the tool chest. So, okay, flash forward to June, 2021. I had had it, it was, it was two hours. I was dyskinetic on, dyskinetic off. Uh, dystonia, I couldn't walk, the cramping in my feet. I was pretty much just closing in. And that's when I stopped looking at the cringy aspect of DBS and maybe, hey, maybe it can help me. So I switched gears and couldn't get down fast enough do my screening. So I did all of that. So, so what I'm hearing is, is that the motor fluctuations and 
you had a response to the medication, but the motor. Function yes. And for the first two, three years, it was wonderful. Yeah. Just, you know, crack off another half a pill just, and then I was, uh, oh, stomping around the house. When can I eat? What can I eat? And I told Robin, when are we ever, when am I ever going to stop talking every hour about this was, situation? Yeah. It was affecting your life and it was time to do something, right? Yes, ma'am. And so you finally decided, you know, DBS was a, a good. Yeah, like, June 20. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. with COVID almost over, I had two, uh, two vaccines in me by the time I did get to go to the hospital in October. We got that ball rolling, went through all the screening process. I have to say there was just really no discomfort. So let's talk about the screening process. Can you walk us through the, the workup and the evaluation? Well, once I said yes, this wonderful office helper appeared. You, Angie, you <laughs> came into the exam room and said, well, let's go over the schedule. This, this, and it's a laundry list. Oh, really? I can't just say market said go. We, okay. And that's typical for me wanting to get it done yesterday. So what we had to go, I had to have three therapists scheduled for me to come in, speech, occupational, and physical therapist ask you to come in raw with no medication from the night before so they can videotape you doing their chores um, in their purview. Yeah. And then you take a break, eat your snack and take your drugs and wait. And then you're on, you're back on. And it was such a relief. So that, that was a minor discomfort to get that done. And it took about three, four hours tops. Did they explain why you had to come on, come in? Oh, yes, because they need to know with the stimulation, where are we headed? What, what are we looking at? What, what will work for me? Okay. Yes. So, oh, it, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Gotcha. So they wanted to see what the medication was going to help, what was going to help with. So mm -hmm. That's what help with. Mm -hmm. Okay. So after the PT evaluation, what else did you have? Cognitive parlor games. Yes. About three, four hours of that, but I'm on my medication, just continuing to take it Dyskinetic, but it's mind games. Yeah, it's just cognitive, oh, where you do your best with shapes and memory recall. Mm -hmm. um, nerve wracking, just in the fact that they're going to evaluate you. And man, I hope I make the cut. So. Yeah. yeah. And then the conference, and then we decided that you were a good candidate. And then, yes, our team gets together without me, and they decide. Um, yeah. So then I got the call, I think it was September, Dr. Rao's assistant called and offered me some dates and I said, hey, yes, to whatever. And uh, pending COVID maybe could pull the rug out from under us, but thank goodness it didn't. So my first was the MRI and uh, I was sedated for that because I'm claustrophobic. The next week was stage one surgery with the electrodes, and it was wonderful. I really did not sweat the whole shave your head thing. Dr. Rao said, I don't have to have it all off, but I opted for that, and it grew back. Ta-da. <laughs> And she said, when you come in in the morning, go ahead and take your first dose of medication because dystonia would have me cramped up and so, so much pain in my legs and my feet. That was a wonderful thing. Just a little tiny sip of water in my first dose. I think they wheeled me back around seven in the morning and then... Uh, 1230, I think Robin took pictures of me in recovery by 1230. It was so easy. And of course, I slept through the whole thing. No bravery at all. I slept through the whole thing. And you stayed over in the hospital? Yeah, just one night and the, everybody was marvelous. So, and yeah. When, when did you come back for stage two? The Exactly one week later. And, and that stage. was in, and that was for the, um, communicator and connect the wiring I have you know left and right and then the wires run down here I could feel 
And uh, they put this, because I had a mastectomy, I didn't have any place to hide it, but that's all right. I'm rather proud of my device. So it's here and I went home that same day again in time for lunch. Um, but after having total general anesthesia for three, three weeks in a row, I was just feeling, I think I need to take a nap. Someone else can tell me I'm wrong, but I don't think I needed any prescription painkillers at all. After that. all of this, I really, it was over the counter maybe a couple of times, but that was it. Okay, okay. What was the restrictions after surgery? Oh, the usual for two months, don't lift anything heavy, um, delegate. <laughs> Thankfully, the family was wonderful about bringing food over, so I didn't have to hoist turkeys in the oven. My sister-in-law and everybody was so great about feeding us and impatiently waiting for the two weeks that the device gets turned on. Gotcha. In between there, there were maybe four days um, I had no symptoms. I was taking no medication and the device wasn't turned on. It was just... I don't know, a phenomenon that's very welcome, but boom, just like that, symptoms came back and I think I was taking medication three times a day instead of eight. So it was still good. 13 days after that last surgery, I went in for my tune up and here's more discomfort. The night before I was not to take any medication. Just go in raw because Dr. Phillips needed to know what are we working with. So programming, so, are we talking about the Yes, program? yeah, programming, okay. activating the device. Mm -hmm. um, and here I'm expecting me to get up and jump around the room, you know, puppeteer, puppet thing. No, it was very subtle. He said, first, we're going to do your right, then we'll do your left. And you just tell me the sensations you're feeling. And the most sensation I think I felt was the hand or foot was feeling warm. He was looking to see my tolerances and tuning the lines, I guess. So he started, um, on, he started on one side and yeah. turned it on. And the miracle occurred within two hours between 9 and 11 that morning. The discomfort, dystonia disappeared. And of course, I've been sitting in an exam room. He says, well, okay, you can go. So the, the uh, tech, Medtronic tech fellow came in and he handed me, here, oh, here it is. Here's my controller. Mm -hmm. Here's the communicator. He just made sure quickly I knew how to use it. And I'm com comfortable with a smartphone. So it has a medical app on there. And he said, dial yourself up, dial yourself down, left and right side. And I did, didn't feel anything. But uh, I think Dr. Phillips set specific parameters. I couldn't go way out there. He just governed it for me. Okay, we're finished. So I stood up, picked up my little bag of snacks and my medication. I thought I was going to need and left, went out to uh, to see the colors were brighter. All of a sudden, my appetite came back because I wasn't on sentiment anymore. And Robin said, you know what? You're standing tall. It was, you know, come to Jesus moment for me. Mm. but it, it was it was a journey to come off your medicine right you didn't come off the day the day oh of no 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 yeah and so the, I left with take it three times a day just mm -hmm. because and I think it was instant release from dyskinesia mm -hmm. but then when I was started it went in phases for three days I was feeling so great and Robin walking tall popped into the gym to say hello to everybody Oh, missed everybody at the gym so much. Um, COVID had me quarantining the whole month of October even before surgeries. I just couldn't go out and risk getting COVID. Went through all the tests prior to surgery too. Um, so then December 3rd, I found myself furniture surfing. I was tipping forward. My balance was a bit off. So you called one morning and said, can you get over here in 30 minutes? And that was from November 8th to December 3rd was my second 
tuning and that's that's it and at that point on december 3rd when dr phillips tweak how my um, parameters on the device and set me up with a little more room to use I'm, I have been completely off all medication for Parkinson's for 16 months now. Oh, <sighs> that's awesome. But Results I, not typical, maybe. Right, right. <laughs> Typically, we don't see medication free with DBS, you know. Sure. And, and I know it's, it's, it's not a mm -hmm. cure. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, so what are, what is your follow-ups like with, you know, after DBS? Do you still have to come and follow up with Dr. Fella? I think, okay, my last appointment when he tuned me, it was December 3rd. The next time I went in as a Parkinson's patient was January. It was 13 months after. You know why? Because there is Angie Condon. You are the conduit. Oh. because Angie is available anytime I have a hiccup or I want to whine about something, she'll get Dr. Phillips here and they'll walk me off the ledge. You know, if I, I was furniture surfing, just boom, boom. And, and then you got him to give me a little more room remotely. Just, it's been minor for me, major, but minor. Do you still have follow-up appointments with us uh, scheduled? Oh yeah. Yeah. But golly gee every six months uh-huh and since i'm not taking medication there's not a lot to talk about because in the past it was always how much are you taking how often are you taking it so we have to come up with something different to talk about <laughs> so, so when do you carry your patient programmer with you is there any time to carry it with you before our uh, boy i used to take it with me everywhere um comes in a handy dandy fit in the glove box and then i realized i'm not changing it all that often but only when i go out of town my battery does not require recharging this battery will just have to be taken out five years maybe four or five years from now and just surgically change out the battery um when I had my pre-operation um, consultation with Dr. Rao, I said, you know, I've, I've seen all these wonderful webinars and you tell me what device I'm going to need. Um, I never really looked into much with Medtronic until <laughs> that morning. Hello, you're getting a Medtronic today. Oh, okay. So uh, I uh, at your discretion team norton knows what you need so I'm trying to think what else hit me with another one well i think you've like gone over everything that i've had um well specifically i guess summarizing i realized my world was getting smaller Parkinson's dictated when I went out, how long I went out of the house. And for the most part, I wasn't doing much of anything. And when I did, I was living in fear of oh, medication. For instance, the September, the month before my surgery, two months, we went on a canoe trip and I thought, how am I? It's a three, four hour paddle. Uh, I'm, you know, my joints stiffen up and it, it could the potential for being quite miserable and having someone carry me out was always in my mind. So I just kept taking my drugs quicker and took out my energies and dyskinesia on paddling faster, faster. But I got through the day, but it wasn't as fun as I know it could be if I weren't constantly worried about my medication. So now I've gone back to volunteering full time last summer and starting again this summer at Udell, just working in the garden as long as I want um, and at home. And I can cook food, whereas before I kind of just gave up. It's just taken my can't list back to I can. I just have to decide if I want to. Yeah. So, awesome. so I can work harder at the gym too. I still go to Rocksteady. I love the folks there. 
big core combat and uh, it's all great. Well, that's awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, everyone there on the screen. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate you sharing your story. And um, I'm happy to. It. I will turn it back over. I think Dr. Rao's back on. Um, back over and see if there's any questions. Um, yeah, thank you, Angie and Holly. Um, Holly, your story is amazing, and you're, you're you all are you're yeah. rock stars. <laughs> thank you for sharing with us. Um, it's my pleasure. I'm sure this is really the most helpful thing for other patients to hear. Um, I I thoroughly I hunted down webinars beforehand, and I guess having friends here too who had also had successes that really helped push me and. And think it's not such a dark, horrible place. Your screening is so thorough. If you didn't think this was advisable, you know, weighing the the good benefits and the risks. So after what happened with me, I'm tickled. I'm I'm yours. Thank you. 